game. If you've been to Creative Mornings before, you know that I kind of like games. <laughs> and um, so two goals that we had for 2015. One was we are part of this amazing global network. There are over 100 cities. And you know, we went to this, um, the global summit in New York in October. And one thing that Tina, who's sort of the head of this whole thing, said was that she really sees that in 10 years, she wants Creative Mornings to be like the creative clearinghouse for the world. So anytime a creative wants to find a collaborator, they want to find a job, they want to find ideas, inspiration, wisdom, um, they go to Creative Mornings. So the online content becomes more integral. The, you know, the community that happens on those Friday mornings becomes really concrete. Um, so we want to help her and help the whole goal and connect with the world. And the second goal is that we really want to engage with you more concretely and sort of help you guys connect with each other, um, rather than this being, being another networking event that you come to that there's like, OK, there's free coffee, whatever, what else? So I had this really random idea. And Wesley Stokey turned it into this. We are part of a connection economy. We are, there are over 100 cities worldwide with creative communities, and we want to connect with them. And I feel like the best way to do that is a game that we like to call Confuse the Germans. <laughs> OK, so not a total flop. I decided that I, this was OK for me to do because my family's German, and so it's fine. So my idea is this. <laughs> my idea is this, is that every month we will choose a new chapter. This month, obviously, is the Berlin chapter. Um, every month we'll choose a chapter. And here's what's going to happen. This is uh, Jurgen and I at the summit in October. And we had an icebreaker game. And the icebreaker was you turn to the person behind you and you say, hi, hello, how are you? My name is, here's what makes me happy. We do a selfie, and then we post it on social media. What we're going to do is Jurgen Siebert in Berlin has no idea this is coming. It's like 3 PM in Berlin right now. He's like having his afternoon coffee, whatever he's doing. And at, right now, like 100 people from Baltimore are going to photobomb him. And he's going to be like, what the hell is going on? I'm so confused. C hence, confuse the Germans. <laughs> So next month, we'll choose a new chapter. And can you imagine in like six months, the entire world is going to be like, who is Baltimore going to confuse today? <laughs> and they're all going to be vying for the position of Baltimore like to, conf to be confused. OK? <laughs> Got it? Yeah. So we're going to do this. Here is, OK, these are his tags. This is the hashtag. So I want you to turn to the person. So the first row, turn to the person behind you. And I guess there's only three rows. So if you could find somebody like next to you, say hi. Take us, take us. Wait, you guys, you got to wait for my instructions. <laughs> so post on Instagram and then push them to Twitter. So awesome work already. I can see that there's amazing pictures coming out of this. So you can find him and the Berlin chapter on Instagram or Twitter. Um, you can do that fancy thing where you like push the picture from Instagram to Twitter. Um, and then you know we'll use this hashtag, ConfuseCM, so that in a year we go back and we're like this yearbook of like blowing people's minds across the world. Um, OK, questions on the blowing the people's minds game? Okay. This is awesome. I can't believe that worked. OK. <laughs> All right. So the reason we are really here today is not to play weird games that I come up with. Um, the reason we're here today really is to hear from Joe Giordano. Um, and you know, as a host, I think about this sometimes, and I really have to be intentional about it, because it's really easy for me to get caught up in the logistics of these events 
So are the chairs in the right place? Did the muffins turn out okay? Uh, are the name tags printed? It's really easy to get caught up in that and lose sight of why we're really here and um, what the meat of this project is really about, which is the content that the artists are, um, or the artists themselves and the content that they're making and, and to hear what they have to say. Um, and this one was uh, easier for me to really dive into that place of like, okay, let me just think about the work itself. Um, <laughs> So let's get serious. Uh, so Joe Giordano, um, photojournalist for many years, photo editor of City Paper, uh, where you perhaps know him best from. Yeah, we, some love from there. Um, so his most recent work was uh, just is, had an exhibit at Reginald Lewis Museum, which was a portrait series of uh, some civil rights activists. A beautiful series of work. And the story behind, I don't know if you're going to tell the story, so I won't tell it, but the, the story behind how he got those portraits was a really fascinating one and uh, speaks to sort of his spontaneity and uh, his uh, ingenuity as an, as an artist. Um, you'll also probably hear, uh, you've probably heard a lot about him from his series, Summer of the Gun, which was a series from in 2013 where uh, he documented the sh um, sort of spree of shootings that were happening that summer. There was over 100 shootings that summer. And um, from, from what I understand, Joe was one of the only, if not one of the few photojournalists that was out taking pictures of what was happening which just like hits me in the gut because you know documenting things that happen in our in our community marks their importance so his work on that series it's beautiful in and of itself in the uh, you know the aesthetics of it and it's emotional but it's also incredibly important important in terms of uh, marking that point in history and how important those lives were and how important those communities were um, so I know that we're not all photographers in this room, but we are all sort of photographers in this room because we hold this sort of connection machine and uh, we all put our lives out there and we all sort of hold our own media company. So I'd encourage you to, even if you're not a photographer, sort of um, listen and understand how we can uh, get some wisdom from how to deal with that lens from Joe. So with no further ado, Joe Giordano. <laughs> Thanks. I'd like to thank uh, Katie, uh, Creative Mornings, and Mail Kimp. <laughs> um, so it actually, Mail Chimp is actually one of the sponsors. So that's what <laughs> double irony, right? Um, so I have to talk about climate, and it's it's cold out. So thank you. Um, so the the climate. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not used. To, I'm used to taking photos and not speaking. So uh, just, just bear with me a little bit. Um, so the, it's, it's a very strange climate in uh, photojournalism right now. Um, because like Katie said, uh, essentially everyone in the room is a photographer. Um, good, bad, and different, everyone has a camera now. And cameras are on all the time. We're worse than London, apparently. We have more cameras. Um, thank you. Somebody got that. And who's the international guy out there? Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> no, so it, it's, it's becoming where photography is, is no longer, uh, a, I think, a talent. It's becoming more of a skill set. So when you apply for a job as a writer or a designer, you're going to be asked, well, do you also take photographs? So I'm essentially obsolete. So I'm like a triceratops, basically. You're, you're looking at the last one. You know, we'll be in the Smithsonian, you know. Um, so it, it's, it's a very strange climate to be a photojournalist now. Um, but that, that being said, I think uh, Baltimore presents um, uh, fantastic opportunities for, for people that are interested in photojournalism. We have so many social ills in the city that not a lot of people, if anyone, are documenting, which is what I'm doing with the work with the homeless, with the summer of the gun. Uh, there's, hang on, we have photos. Uh, is it just play? I have Apple TV. I should actually know how to do this. <laughs> which, is it play or? There we go. OK. So this is the this is, uh, Summer of the Gun series, um, which came about because I noticed that no one was documenting the homicide rate in the city uh, photographically. The issue of um, layoffs at the sun, closure of magazines and newspapers, is really leading to a, a, a colder, a much colder climate in uh, f photojournalism. But I think the future is, is kind of what I'm concentrating on, is doing series and packages and presenting it to people. Uh, the days of you showing up to a publication and saying, here's my work, hire me, they're finished. They're, they're done. 
you know, it's, it, it's like going to a telephone office and saying, hey, I know how to run a telegraph machine. You know, it's, it's finished. Um, so the, the future of photojournalism is, is going to be these type of series. Um, so it's a, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty interesting uh, climate. Um, and what, what I tell students is that they, if they turn the cameras away from the mirrors and the selfies and turn it outward, um, they can do a lot of good. A lot of good has come out of the series that I've worked on. And I used to work strictly with in uh, fashion, quote, fashion and advertising. And I gave all that up because it just it's, one, it wasn't fulfilling. Um, it's like eating a vat of cotton candy. You know, it's just, it's, it's, in the end, it's nothing. And you, if you go through fashion magazines now, 90s, 80s, 70s, you, you, this is filled with photographs, but you don't know who these people are. They didn't, you know, it's, it's not really contributing to the greater good, which is what I wanted to get back to. So I wanted to change my own, my personal climate. <laughs> See what I did? Climate? Okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I, I was given a theme, you know, I'm, I, I'm not a meteorologist, so I, I don't, I don't really know. So I had to put that back in there. Um, Good. And I have to just, you guys are nuts for coming out this morning. Thank you very much. Because <laughs> I would not be here to listen to me. I'm just saying. Okay? I'd be like, that guy, man. I was out drinking and it's freezing cold. So, um, okay, so, so, so back on point. So I, I think that the, the, the future of, of photojournalism is, product, is, is project based, and, and that's what I do. And then I got back into it with Summer of the Gun. I went to my editor, I presented him with the title, Summer of the Gun. Evan at the city paper, and he basically got it, bought it sight unseen. He's like, that's a great marketing. Like, Summer of the Gun has become this phrase now. Um, and then I, I just went back to shooting photojournalism, and I, I was really surprised at being at it, a lot of these scenes that there were no other photojournalists there. I mean, I would be the first one and the only one to show up for about 99% of these, unless there was a kid involved, and then the sun would come down. Um, and one or two people would be there, and that would be it. Um, so these, these are all, this was the summer of 2013, where it was one of the most violent summers um, in, in, uh, in Baltimore uh, history. Um, there, there, was, there was a dip in crime, a dip in homicides over the winter months, which I, I think is because it's colder out. I'm not being facetious, I'm being serious. There's not a lot of data to support that, but I mean, everyone's on the street in the summertime because it's so unbelievably hot. Working in Baltimore, um, a, a lot of us here probably don't get to the outer part of the city, to the west side, to the east side, to the Park Heights side, to the Sinclair Lane side. But I can tell you, one, there's no trees. And it, it, it's like being in a war zone. I mean, the people that live there uh, are living in essentially a war zone. The helicopter's overhead, the building's falling down. It's like seeing photographs of like, of like Beirut. I mean, they're not being bombed, but they're, they're being killed, essentially. And everyone's angry. The police are angry. The citizens are angry. No one's talking to each other. It's, it's, it's a big mess. Um, so this, this, this particular, uh, this shooting was an execution um, on the east side in Highland, Greetown, which is really rare, which is, I, I would have my, I have a scanner app, police scanner app that I would keep on. So it would be next to the bed all night and just run and run. And when I, when I heard this address, I'm from Baltimore, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty familiar with the streets uh, when I hear one. Th this is over off of, um, uh, Bond Street, which is in, in part of Greetown, and uh, it was an execution. The guy was shot in the back of the head in front of his pregnant girlfriend. Uh, it's in a Latino community, and I've never seen a community so angry at the police. And it, it's really sad. When I would go out to to the west side or to the east side, the residents there are pretty much resigned to the fact that the cops don't care, and that they're not they're ineffectual at catching any of these gunmen. So the Latino community was really like, you know, they were, sorry, go back. Um, these are a little bit out of order. Sorry, we'll get to that. Anyway, I'll find it. Um, so the Latino community was really upset with, this is the only time that I was actually threatened with bodily harm was in the Latino community. Um, in the African American community, I was welcomed because I was there documenting something that nobody else was documenting and they really felt that that needed to be done. The Latino community, I was pretty much chased out by these gang members uh, and threatened with bodily harm. And that's when I was like, all right, you know, I got, I got one shot of the guy being really angry and I was like, all right, I'm done, no mas. You know, which, which, which they thought was funny, the one gang guy started cracking up. So I do use humor, by the way. Uh, it works really well. Um, but that's, that's the only community that really took the police to task. And guess what? They caught the guy. And that, that really, I mean, being immersed in this, in, in the murder culture for an entire summer, really opened my eyes up to the community, to the policing, things like that. Um, so 
my, my roundabout point is, is that if you, come, if, if you want to get into photojournalism nowadays, you really have to come up with an idea and a series or a story to sell to a publication um, or to sell. You, you just can't really show up with your camera, take a few pretty pictures and leave. You, it's really an immersive ex experience. Um, so these are, these are more, I, I just put a, a little slideshow together of the summer of the gun work. And what I also tried to do is I tried not to just take um, you know, snapshots. I tried to use the creative side of my brain to, to compose a lot of things. Um, like this one. I mean, this is one of my favorite photos. Um, you know what it is. There's a lot of uh, negative space. Like, I really like the blacks is what I saw when everyone else was snapping away at something else. So I, I think that... This part of the series really resonated with people was the fact that I, I brought kind of a artistic eye to a, a crime scene. Um, am I doing okay? I don't, nobody's, everyone's awake? Right. Uh, good, sorry. Um, I'm not Baynard Woods. I can't like do this for like an hour. <laughs> um, so this was, a, yeah, th this was a, a scene that was um, over off uh, Park Heights in the community. And, and one thing, one, one thing I, I will, and I'll touch on it when I get to another photograph that I took for a specific reason. Um, everyone knew this kid, and this was a drive-by. Um, and this is, this is pretty much how close I was to the crime scene. Now, as the, more, the more I shot, the more the police were afraid of me. And the further and further away they were putting the crime scene tape, to the point where Justin Fenton was like, dude, thanks, man. Like, seriously. <laughs> like, we never had, really, they, when, when I was really at every crime scene shooting all this stuff, the police got, they don't, there's certain things they don't want people to see. Um, and so they started making it harder and harder. This is uh, uh, for me to take photos. Um, but this is just, again, this is more the community. I, I tried to also get community photos and, and photos around the crime scene to kind of humanize um, the area. So it's just not this, uh, it's not exploitation. Like I was really worried about it being, you know, like porn, like murder porn, I'd call it. And I, I don't want that. And I, I interacted a lot with the community. I talked to people. Um, one, one of the things, sorry. <coughs> Um, one of the things that I do is, and I tell, I tell the students that I talk to, like at MICA and at UMBC, is that if you're on a crime scene, I, I found it extremely helpful to get the victim's name before I did any shooting. So if I walked up to somebody on the street and said, excuse me, how did you know Davon? As opposed to, do you know the victim? <laughs> you know, and, and really, that, that little bit of humanness opened these incredible doors I was invited to a funeral, which you'll see, um, of a guy that was gunned down over off Park Heights Avenue because of that, because I cared. And if you want to be a good photojournalist, you have to care. Don't buy into that. We don't help people. You know, you have to stay outside of the situation. Tim Hetherington, who's one of the greatest photojournalists ever, he's killed in, uh, Li in Libya. He, he said that you have to be a human being first. Um, it's a very famous case, Kevin Carter. Anyone know? You guys know? Okay, so there was a photograph um, in 1993 of the little girl in the vulture. You guys remember that photo? It won the Pulitzer Prize, it won the press photo. It was uh, during the famine in, in Rwanda. And it's a little girl, she's like curled up and there's a vulture just over her shoulder. So the photojournalist who took that was accused of not helping her and there just to take the photo and not picking the little girl up, but she didn't. He ended up committing suicide because of all of, the, all of the press around the photo. And, he, and that, that's what I mean about being human. If he had just picked that little girl up and taken her to a, I mean, what, what difference would it? It would have helped her. He still would have had the photograph. So my point is, is that when you're out being a photojournalist, it's very important to keep the human aspect in mind and not just be an observer. Um, you're there to observe. It's a very fine line. You're there to observe, but you're also there to be a human being first. So this is, uh, this is the girlfriend of, uh, sorry, I don't know why these are, I put these in order, but they're kind of scared. This is the girlfriend of the, of the kid who was gunned down, who you saw um, this one. This is the same community. All three of these are, are in the same community. So this is all at the, at the scene. Um, sorry, it's, it's a little graphic, early morning. Um, this, this was a, a crime scene of a 12-year-old uh, who was gunned down on his bike um, over at, at Preston and Ashland Avenue which is on the east side over by Hopkins. It's that area that's behind kind of Hopkins Hospital. Um, and, th and that's, you know, back to climate again, it was extremely hot. This is about a 105 degree day. White, just black tarmac, white sidewalks, no trees. Um, and, and people wonder, I mean, why, 
why, why these communities get so angry. I think a lot of it has to do with, there's, there's no luxuries that we take for granted, like trees. Like you, we take trees for granted, shade. There's no shade. Dri I'm telling you, so start driving, go up Patterson Park Avenue, up North Avenue, make a, a right on Patterson Park Avenue, drive through those neighborhoods, find me a tree, take a photo, I'll pay you because they're just not there. And, and, and these, these are little things that I think a lot of the wealthier communities in the, in the city take for granted. Um, this, this was another one of the war zone shows. This was a helicopter flying over. Um, it, was, it was a really bad scene. This, this woman, she was great. Again, I tried to bring the artistic guide. Sorry, can you see? Okay, is that better? I can move out of the way. I can stop talking into a slide. <laughs> It'd be great. I'll just be like, climb it. Climate, you know, <laughs> staying on point, um, which is fine. I'd rather have these. But but this is an interesting woman. Uh, one of the one of the things and I, f I should have mentioned this earlier was I was taking audio clips of people at the scene, where I would just um, interview them really quickly and just say, you know, what is your name? What do you think of the incident? Um, how do you think the police are handling it? This woman was very intuitive. She's 85 year, years old. Lives right, right by, right here. And this is what she's exposed to. If you look over here. This is, a, this is a, a memorial to another shooting. That shooting is there. That's another shooting. She lives over here. So she sees this all the time. And she said that, um, that the police treat her like a suspect. This is why she stops calling the police. It's, 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 very, it's very racially divided. And it, it's, it's, not, it's not a joke. It's, it's real. It's a real divide. So she stops calling the police because they come to her house and treat her like a suspect in her own neighborhood. Um, what else we got? Okay, this is the nighttime stuff. This is, I shot these at 3200. These are another, uh, <clears throat> another crime scene. This is off Ashton Avenue also. Um, this is, okay, so th this is something that always fascinated me about going to crime scenes, is that I, I watched them, uh, there was a, a triple homicide over off of, uh, over off of New, uh, North Carrollton Street. And I watched the EMTs hose away. You know, they, they clean up the crime scene. If you see the blue gloves anywhere, that means somebody got shot pretty, pretty much nearby. Um, so they were hosing, they were hosing off the, uh, the curb. And I, I just, I kept thinking to myself, that, that, that's a person. You know, they're, they're hosing off this thick DNA. This person got up in the morning, had breakfast, hung out, talked on the phone, and now they're, they're gone. And it just, it really, I mean, I, I think I think too much, more than most photographers do, like about stuff like that. But it, it just, and, and the EMTs, they leave the clothes behind. So what happens is if you're shot, they, they essentially strip you. They have to get to the wound. So they got to cut all this stuff off. And then they just leave the personal belongings for whomever. You know, it's, it, it's, a, really, it's a really strange, almost like a ritual. It's really strange. Um, and that's one thing I, I noticed. And that's back to the human part. Like you have to think of these people as humans. You know, I'm not there to judge. Like I, I tell my students, I, I don't take sides, I take photographs. So gang member, passerby, I don't judge. That's not for me to do. I'm there to record and to interact. So it just, it just, it just blew my mind that you know, these remnants of human beings are just being left all over the city. You know, it's these little memorials. If there's any sculptors out there, these would make great bronzes, by the way. We'll, we'll talk about a collaboration. Um, <laughs> So this is okay. So this is a uh, you know more more of the human side. This is a, a woman who just found her son was shot, um, and she collapsed. So uh, this this was over in um, in South Baltimore, across the Hanover Street Bridge by Cherry Hill. Um, this is again this is one of the more humane pictures. This was a school shooting, and he was an officer, and uh, she ran right to him, which I thought was fantastic. Um, this is one of the rare times that I had a law enforcement officer actually interacting with the public when it comes to these crime scenes. And I think that was, a, that was just a great, a great moment. That I'm, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I actually got to capture that. Um, this is an arrest over off, uh, over off Preston. Um, <laughs> this guy was hanging around with a warrant around a crime scene. It really wasn't even related to the, to the shooting. Like, don't hang around a crime scene with a warrant, man. Like, come on. <laughs> you know. But see, again, I mean, if, if you juxtapose these two photos, I put these together for a reason. That photo, see the, the interaction between the officer and the girl? And that photo, how far away and distant, I mean, that officer is. And again, I don't know what this guy did, and I'm not there to care what he did. I'm there to record. And I recorded this, this very, this is how people are treated, very standoffish. You know, and if you're told over and over again you're nothing but a criminal, well, you're probably going to end up being a criminal. 
So, okay, this is the photo I, I wanted to show you about the crime scene. So they pushed me four blocks away from the crime scene. Yeah, four blocks away and started to put the crime scene tape up. They can essentially block off, you know, 10 blocks if they want. It's a crime scene. So this is why I, I, I wanted this shot for a reason. I, also, I like the lighting on his bald head. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so the, the, he said, you look, you got to go. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, we're, we're moving the crime scene. And what, I mean, I, I can, what am I going to do? If I get locked up, fine, but it's still not going to change anything. So that, that's why I included that photo, because I thought it was pretty, uh, it was pretty important. So <clears throat> this is back to the neighbor thing. Um, this was in August, and that's the remnants of an eight-year-old that was been gunned down over her shoulder um, right there. And I wanted this. This is what I call like a silent witness. And a lot of Edward Hopper paintings, they have this person called the silent witness. Um, he's the guy in Nighthawks with his fedora down. You don't see his face. And you start looking for it. There's a lot of these in Hopper's paintings. So she, she's my son. I didn't want to, I didn't talk to her. I just, she was just sitting on her stoop, staring out at, you know, the shooting that just happened in front of the, uh, in front of the house. So this, this is, this is uh, part of the reason sometimes, I mean, this is a, a tragic scene. Um, there was a kid gunned down at that corner and church had let out and these church ladies just didn't want to have any of it. They walked underneath the crime tape straight across the crime scene. <laughs> didn't, you know, they're, they're so, there's one, they're so used to it and two, um, there's a lot of respect in the community for the church, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, um, which does help a lot out. But they, uh, I took this photograph because I was just amazed that they were just so brazen in the cop. What are the cops going to do? You know, lock up three old ladies. But they literally up, they lifted up the thing. You can see the bike. You can see the, this is the bike the kid was on right there. And again, there's another monument. See that? So it, it, it's repetitive. A lot, of these, a lot of these locations are very repetitive. Um, okay, this is the aunt. Now, this is this is the uh, this this is the, the human. Back to my. I wish I had to put this first. When I was talking about humanizing uh, f photographs. So she was the aunt of a, a guy who was Davon Akami, who was gunned down in Park Heights. And I went up to her and I said, "Hey, you know, how did you know Davon?" She goes, "I was his aunt." Um, and she allowed me to take these photos. And I put both of these in there because I want people to know that it, this was not a stolen photo. I didn't just turn around and see her weeping. I, I, I put the camera up and she didn't stop me, you know. Um, I called her three days later. Uh, I, I, knew, I knew he had passed away, but I, I called her at a courtesy three days later to check on the family. And she thought it was very nice, thanked me, and then um, invited me to his funeral, which is here uh, over on Park Heights. Um, so I, I, I interviewed some family members on the audio, uh, talked to the funeral director, which is really interesting. I didn't get her portrait because she, she, didn't, she didn't want me to, but I talked to the funeral director about the toll that the, the funeral, these funerals take on families. I mean, if, if, you're, if your loved one is gunned down, um, you have to go like $10,000 like on the spot. So people try to barter. It, it's, it's a whole other story, but it's really interesting, uh, really interesting um, dichotomy between the uh, funeral home and the, and the victim's families. Um, this is up by the, the casket. This is how close I was allowed to get at this funeral just because I was nice to a person at a crime scene. So if you're going into photojournalism, this is the thing you need to know because this is the access you will get by being a human being and not just a machine with a camera. So um, this, is, this is more from the, I, and I followed all the way to the, uh, uh, the procession all the way out to the um, cemetery. Um, this is the casket. Uh, this, this is one of my favorite photos. This pretty much sums up the neighborhood and the media <laughs> in one picture. You know, dude, dude lives around the corner. I talked to him. Dude lives around the corner, and Jay Z was just there hanging out. And this, this, this is one of my favorite. I mean, I, I had to put something light in here because you guys would be like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this pretty much sums up the media and the neighborhood in one, in one frame. Uh, okay, so this is, this is the homeless series, and again, this is where the, the project came up. I look out my window at the Baltimore Sun, on the third floor at the Baltimore Sun, and there is a, well, there was a huge homeless encampment that nobody had ever covered. The, I, I, I talked to the uh, sun photographers, they're friends of mine, and it never occurred to them to just walk across the street. And it became this entire series I worked on this summer called uh, Camp 83 which was the one that was on Guilford. If you guys come down Guilford Avenue, there was that big encampment. And um, they, they loved the fact that someone was paying attention to um, their, 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 the, the problem over there. And what happens 
is that especially in Baltimore, um, because we're such a small community between with government and police, is that as soon as this series ran, aid workers came down, help. I mean, it, it's, it was really, I really felt good. It was photojournalism in action. There was a, a great result. It wasn't just me showing up to a war zone, taking photos and leaving. Um, people actually were saved because of this. Masella, she was taken into a woman's home, uh, or home for women out in the Baltimore County after this ran. Um, this is a, this is Harrison Harvey. This gangrene on his feet from living on the street. Um, he, uh, he asked me for five bucks. I said, I'll give you five bucks if you go get peroxide and clean that up. And he did. Um, he was saved. He ended up at Code Blue, which was, uh, which was really good. They came down and got him. He walks now and gangrene. He, they cut his toe off, but he walks now, so that's great. Um, this is Sean. He was one of the gay teens living down there. There's so many stories with this encampment that nobody else in the city thought to pick up. So that was back to my point about, uh, about storytelling. Um, oh, yeah, um, climate. <laughs> okay. Good. Sorry, stay on point. Um, and you can see, and you can see, this is a Baltimore Sun building. Right there in the back. There's one reason why I, I really, I want to plug City Paper real quick. Um, it, it, is, it is like the last bastion of really old school journalism in the city. I mean, I know we're doing our job because everyone hates us, so that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, uh, there's no party lines. Everyone can't stand us, which means we're, we're doing our jobs. Um, but, but they, you know, the Sun just, they didn't have time for any, any of this kind of photo series unless they're assigned it. You know, there's no really creative outlet over with the other photojournalists in the city. Um, so she built this. I mean, this is an old bed right here. I mean, this, this little enclave was built by her and uh, her partner. Um, this is Masella in her new home. That's her. And this is the home. Because of the story, this is her at her, her home in Baltimore County. So. This is um, a homeless woman being arrested by the police. Um, there's still not a lot of sensitivity, I think, with the homeless and the police department. See a theme here with the police department? Oh. <laughs> you know, they, they really, they're not, they're not a citizen police force anymore. Uh, full disclosure, my, my father's a retired Baltimore City cop. Um, he was 80s, 70s and 80s. Um, and he, even he agrees, you know, he and I talked about the summer of the gun and then this homeless series. That, I mean, you know, cops back then, they were far from perfect. They were harassing people, but the community would still come to them. You know, that's the big difference. Even through the 60s, with the, with the Panthers and the anti-police movement, neighbors would still come to the police. You don't see that anymore at all. And it, it's really, they don't walk the beat anymore. And this is what you get. You know, this is, they don't relate to people anymore. So, um, this is, uh, this is Daryl. He was one of the residents. This was part of the sweep when the city came out and put these guys up in a hotel um, for about two months. So this is his new space. He'd been on the street for about uh, four years straight. Um, he had cancer. Um, one of the departments at Hopkins read this or saw the photo story and came down and te they're testing. They were testing him because of this. Make sure uh, because of the story. So they they were aware of of him and they came down to do a swab, which is great. Okay. So this this next story is uh, a pretty personal. Um, this, this never ran, so you guys are the, really the only people really seeing these photos. Um, this, this happened last uh, end of last winter, it's been a year. Um, this is right before the city paper got bought and I ended up, I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks for, um, call bladder, but whatever. Um, <laughs> There's nothing glamorous, you know, I wasn't stabbed or shot in the line of duty. Um, <laughs> But so, so this, because the paper was being bought and we, our website was down, this, it just, the story got too cold. Climate. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, the story got too cold and uh, they, they, just, they just shelved it. But this is a story I was working on about the working poor in Baltimore. So this, um, this guy, he gets up every morning. This is about uh, 3.30 in the morning. He gets up every morning, he has a, um, a, a wife and a, a young son who's deaf. He uh, has breakfast by himself. They're still asleep. They're asleep over here in the other room, um, in, the, in the living room. She's a Micah grad, by the way, his wife, and they're living at poverty level. And these, art, these art schools do not teach these kids what they need to be taught because there's nothing glamorous about this. So he gets up in the morning by himself. 
gets on the, uh, he, he takes a bus. If anyone's familiar with the Park Heights area, he's like right on the outer rims. He has, he has to get up in the morning, walk from his apartment, take a bus that comes down this side street, get downtown. He takes the first light rail at about 5 a.m. This is on Howard. He takes the first light rail down to BWI airport every morning to work at a smoothie stand for five bucks an hour. So, that's to feed his family. That's him, that's uh, Zach. That's one of my favorite photos, too. That's him in, interacting with Zach, which is great. Um, this is um, his wife, uh, Zakia. She is a very important, uh, she's on a lot of citizen councils. She does what she can with the community. This is them, she has no babysitter because there's no money. So she has to take him to all these meetings in the middle of the winter, the baby. So all right, this is my new series coming up. So again with the, you know, so it, actually it's great because now, I'm, and I'm not joking, I didn't realize how much climate p plays into all these photos. We went from summer to winter. Yeah, which is great. So thanks, Katie. <laughs> Thank you. I see, what, I see what you did there. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, does anybody have any questions? I mean, I know I'm supposed to give this long, rambling talk, but I, I really, if anyone has any, while well, I have the slides up. Well, let's wait for questions until you're totally done, because I want to get people on the mic with questions. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. That's, that's cool. So my next, my next step is I was working on the protests. By the way, this is uh, Audrey Gatewood and Josh. You don't know who they are now, but you will in about 10 years. So they're fantastic. Um, so we, we were all working together on the, the Ferguson protests and things like that. And I, and I actually had, uh, had uh, a lot of friends on Facebook ask me, are you flying out to Ferguson? I don't have to fly out to Ferguson. My, my job is here, is to document the Tyrone West, the people that are being killed here, not in Ferguson. It's not my city. The only thing I would have to contribute to Ferguson is what, a, a, a cool Instagram photo or a time, you know, a, a photo in time, and, and that doesn't help anybody. So what we do is we were documenting these, and I, I took that to the next level um, with, uh, I, this, is a new, this is a new art series that I've been working on, um, where I'm actually dissecting my own photos and using colors as emotional triggers. It sounds like a lot of art gobbledygook, but it actually makes sense in my mind. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I'm, I'm using, this is what, it's, it's it, the series is called When a Fire Starts to Burn, and it, it's, um, it's about media manipulation and how you're supposed to feel when you look at photos. Um, this, I put these in for the Sondheim Award this year. Um, these are some of the protest stuff, um, again, with this. And it, it was really interesting. I went back, and this was, a, this was a, an injured protester uh, who was thrown off a truck while, while protesting here in Baltimore. Um, it's actually a light pink color. It's not really showing out there. but. Um, yeah, it's using color coding to, to create an emotional response. Um, so that's, that's it for the slideshow. Um, should I say anything else about climate? Because I had like, yeah, I had a...